in that frailty and that human side, I saw a lot of leaders doing it really, really tough. And probably the one thought that I would have to definitely avoid, uh, and everything was laid up in order for this to really happen, uh, is to isolate. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Transformative Talks, where we discuss all things transforming leadership. Today, we've got Michael Murphy with us. He brings 35 years of leadership experience, a cross-cultural sensitivity, and a master's degree in leadership. Impressive. Great to have you with us, Michael. Thanks, Steve. It's great to be with you. Yeah. Now, Michael, with his wife, Valerie, was associate minister at Hillsong Church for its first 12 years, and then senior pastor of Shire Life Church in the south of Sydney for 18 years. He's got a really impressive uh, senior leadership track record in church leadership. In recent years, he's founded Leaderscape. It's a consultancy focused on championing and coaching leaders to greatness. I think it's what we all need to hear. So it's uh, going to be great to hear what Michael has to say. On top of all that, he's an enthusiastic leader. He's a great communicator, and I'm sure that he'll inspire you with his faith and with his ideas. So again, Michael, welcome. Great to have you with us. I wonder if you'd start by just telling us a little bit about your leadership journey and about Leaderscape. First of all, I need to take you everywhere I go and do the introduction. Uh, <laughs> way, way better than I feel that I am. But it's an honour to be here with you. Uh, we've journeyed for decades now in the Alpha Crucis you know, journey. As you said, we've been doing this for a long time, Thirty, I think coming up for 38 years. And, uh, and over that time, the highs and lows of uh, of, of circumstances externally and internally. I think that having been a, a church pastor, both on an executive team and as a lead pastor, uh, it's now almost the natural uh, evolution for the last several years of us coming alongside God's generals, as you said, in the, in the form of leaderscape. Um, we love what we do. We feel it's a, an honor to come alongside those that are on the front lines and particularly through the season that we've just been through. This has been really a remarkable season for leadership in any field, and particularly for church leadership. What have you observed during the COVID-19 lockdown? In a word, courage. Courage. Honestly, many church leaders, and in some cases, through the efforts and behaviours of very much a few, have copped a bit of a raw deal uh, over these last decades. Uh, particularly in the media and so forth. Uh, but I've observed um, leaders all over the globe in UK and Europe and the Americas through Asia and Australasia really put in the big ones. And uh, what they've done, uh, admittedly, thrust upon them externally in having the courage to, uh, hate the word, but pivot their churches in the case, in the, in the matter of a couple of days, marshal their teams whether they are resource light under 100 people on a Sunday pre-COVID, which of course the vast majority of churches, or several hundred or several thousand. Um, i got to say, Steve, I've been so impressed um, with far and away uh, the majority of lead pastors around the world that we had the privilege of working alongside. Yeah, that's great news. It's good to hear that, Michael, and uh, courage, absolutely. Uh, a critical component of um, any leadership's armory of their behaviour. Any other good behaviours you've observed during this time? And, and uh, I don't know whether you've seen anything that you think people shouldn't reproduce, any bad behaviours. Of, but... of course. I think uh, in the midst of the humanity, as leaders were forced to plummet the depths of, of what was in them, uh, I would have to say, uh, again, in the main, uh, an increased dependency on Jesus. Um, and that, that honestly sounds so terribly cliched, uh, but, but, you know, after you've been doing anything for a certain amount of time, you kind of learn how to do it, right? It's easy to become pro professional in, in any profession, including the ministry. And, and when some of the stable components or the, or the linchpins are taken away from you, uh, what is showing up is in fact, how dependent we really are upon God. And again, I think a great quality is a return just to some of the basics of dependent on the Holy Spirit and getting back to the mission and the mandate of the kingdom of God, rather than getting too caught up in methodologies that we can so easily idolize. Yeah, that's good news. And um, nothing to avoid? Oh, yeah, of course. I think, uh, I think that when you are buffeted from every side and, uh, you know, my heart goes out particularly to our friends in the U.S., 
many of our, uh, our lead pastor friends there, um, they, they had uh, COVID and some, one might argue not handle all, all that well, though it's patchy and contextual state to state. They had uh, the racial uh, situation that they're not alone in that, 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 that came to the fore in, in many nations, but was so strong in, in the US. Uh, they then had the election to contend with, where it seemed that whether a congregation member was red or blue, that they in, instantly uh, obtained a PhD and how to better run the church than the lead pastor, and the, their opinions were on steroids. Uh, and then I had some friends, dear friends in the deep south that got blown away literally by a hurricane. Mm. Uh, so it seemed one thing after another. Uh, and I think in those situations, uh, I think that it's so easy to be affected and to have our thinking skewed and, and be influenced by the noises and the significantly loud voices around us mm. rather than pinning, uh, pinning our hopes and pinning our aspirations in the promises of God. Mm. Uh, and so I think in that frailty and that hum, human side, uh, I saw a lot of leaders doing it really, really tough. And probably the one thought that I would have to definitely avoid, uh, and everything was, was, was laid up in order for this to really happen, uh, is to isolate, yeah. is to yeah. try and tough it out yourself. I think that because of the shared experience, uh, that was probably in the minority there was a, a whole lot of seemingly organic and spontaneous engagement of pastor to pastor uh, that I think was really useful. But my gosh, those that did isolate, I think they did struggle. Yeah, great insights, Michael. And great to hear that in general, leaders uh, coped really well and demonstrated yeah, exactly. commendable behaviours uh, yeah. behaviors that connected them back to the core of what they're doing. Um, yeah, exactly. Leading people to Jesus. You know, we often uh, read that um, leadership begins with a vision and that uh, mission-driven organisations are the most successful organisations. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if you've noticed the impact of uh, the role of vision and mission in the groups, the people you've been working with during this period. Yeah. Uh, look, let me start with a confession. You know, I'm Michael Murphy and I'm an activity holic. Uh, I think that one of the things I did, particularly early on as a younger leader, uh, in the absence of clarity, um, I would just throw activity stuff at the wall, hoping that something would stick and some fruitfulness would come out of it. Uh, I, I, I fear that I'm not alone there. Um, and I think that busyness is the byproduct of indecision. Uh, and indecision uh, grows beautifully in the, in the uh, garden bed of uncertainty. And we've certainly had a lot of uncertainty. Um, when methods change so much, in fact, there's a little, you probably can't read it from, uh, from where you are, uh, but uh, there's an old school world map that a former youth pastor did a bit of a bit of an artist uh, with gold leaf over the top. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, uh, Matthew 28. And uh, I, I've kept that behind me for the entire 2020 season uh, because uh, it's a constant reminder to myself and uh, anyone that would care to, to, to listen and watch that um, that the mandate of the kingdom hasn't changed one little bit. That the mission of the church, God's not up in heaven scratching his head, quizzically looking at over at Gabriel going, what the heck are we going to do now? Yeah. And so I think that uh, though the temptation was to, to elevate the methodologies that were definitely shifting like crazy, I think in the main, uh, mission and vision, though vision uh, took a different form during this time. Uh, they were very important. Obviously connected to vision and mission um, is culture yeah. and values and behaviours, but the culture in general. Have you observed anything, uh, strong cultures, weak cultures, effective, yeah. ineffective cultures, anything to uh, help us with our culture? Oh, look, I think that um, life-giving, strong, uh, Bible, really Bible-centred culture, um, those churches really did extraordinarily well. I was, I was on the phone, in fact, just a few hours ago uh, to a lead pastor in Kalamazoo, Michigan, mm. uh, getting pretty chilly up there this time of the year. But uh, he, he, he was uh, talking to me quite matter-of-factly about the fact that their finances are up 30% from last year. Wow. That's fabulous. Now, I happen to know that he's been a, a man that has gone out of his way to strongly disciple the people of his church, and I'll say 
particularly, if I'm allowed these days, the men of his church. So he, he built some very strong men that, are, that were centered in God's word. And so what happened was in the, in the challenge of the season, uh, those people rose up and, uh, and those churches were stronger than ever. I'd have to say that there's a stack of churches that did okay, that were doing okay. Yeah. There's a small percentage, maybe less than 20% that were up. And I only mentioned money, not because it's the bottom line, but because it's probably the most empirical measure of the health of the church out of the uh, people give out of the abundance of their heart, yeah. where their treasure is in their heart. We also, and, and you can flip that over, I think as well. And so those that were, had a strong life-giving culture, I'd say have excelled in this time. Uh, those that went into this week uh, will be among the company of those, sadly, uh, mm -hmm. that, that close their doors, not to reopen them uh, mm -hmm. once the, the COVID cloud moves on. Yeah. Hey, great, great insight there, Michael. I've always wanted to go to Kalamazoo, you know, just because of the name. It's, it's totally, it's cool, isn't it? Freaking yeah. name. Yeah. <laughs> i, I got to say, I hope there's not too many Kalamazoonians uh, uh, <laughs> offended here, but uh, <laughs> the name's pretty good. But it's a, it's, it's a, it's a tough town. <laughs> yeah. Look, um, so there's a discussion with one church leader, and you would have had many, many discussions over this last year. Um, yeah. Was there any typical advice that they were seeking and uh, perhaps any typical advice that you were giving them? Church life is complex. Hmm. Um, and any time you, you instigate a model, it always falls short of reality. That's the truth. Hmm. But nonetheless, a model or templates are useful in allowing leaders to bring some kind of predictability onto the slippery slopes of, of the uncertainty of the season we've been through. Um, and I won't say that people just want simple answers, but I think that one of the things, you know, clearly the vision of a local church has got to come from God to the leadership of that church. Uh, clearly, the, the, the type of people that a particular congregation, are they urban, are they suburban, are they, uh, what nation are they in? Um, mm -hmm. That's going to be quite variegated based upon context. Each leader is quite different in terms of their emphasis. So there are so many things that are changeable. I do, however, believe that in the midst of that, there are some predictable, transferable principles mm -hmm. and patterns that can help a leader to get back to basics. We're now ministering uh, all of our leaderscape material uh, has been just tra translated into Spanish to roll out through Central and South America. I did a call yesterday with, I think, uh, 23 country managers uh, that would be lead, lead lead pastors overseeing their nations that will who, whose mission it will be to take uh, the material that we've produced uh, contextualize it and, and take it to South America. That whole thing happened when the leaders of those movements, totaling about 50,000 churches, realized that when COVID hit, they were entirely unprepared. They, be, they built their whole ministry around stadiums, uh, events, uh, large gatherings. And when that was taken away from them, I think they had to cancel 140 conferences across the the, the, the continent uh, that was going to be uh, attracting 50,000 churches. So I say all that to say their cry, and I think it's the cry of many leaders around the world, theirs quite dramatically, is let's get back to helping people to be self-feeders. Let's get back to help people to be genuinely disciple makers. And number three, to be leader developers. And yeah. so we've that's been the cry of pastors apart from the obvious encouragement that's needed when you're going through, uh, you know, World War Three for some of them, what felt like anyway. Uh, and so we've endeavoured to help provide them with the kind of support that would give uh, the sort of templates that could maybe bring some clarity uh, in the midst of the uncertainty and confusion of the season. I think uh, as I've been listening to you in this period of pressure, what do you think leaders need to do when it gets hard, in COVID or outside of COVID? When leadership gets really hard, what advice would you give a leader to do and to avoid? 
I mean, I think it does force us, I touched on it a moment ago, but to go back to basics. And I know, again, that can be a real cliche. Church life has such a habit of adding stuff, of adding some things that, that you know, may be valuable or important, seem important in a green room uh, or with peers um, or even uh, riding on the back of decades or more of tradition. Um, but when we get confronted with what, most church leaders were confronted with, it almost has the, the, the potential of snapping us out of some of the directions we've been taking and, and, and to help us to reassess and even to do a reset where even subconsciously the question is, well, what's important at the end of the day? What am I really going to pour my limited time and energy and resources into? And so I would have to say, uh, echo that, uh, cheer that, champion that, to, to go back to basics, to go back to the gospel of the kingdom of God, to go back to the fact that they are called by God. We spend a lot of time, but we've really stepped it up several notches about helping lead pastors, particularly in their key teams, to own their morning. And by that, I simply mean to, to slab out a, a bunch of time and to prioritise in that time, not so much the doing, but the being. Again, excuse the cliche, but for them to get, and we've been pitching this pretty strongly, uh, two, two and a half hours in God's presence, worshipping God, in God's word. We've even helped them develop affirmations that cause the promises of God to start to become defaults in their heart. Um, and again, it's not new fandangled. It's not sort of new agey. It's simply meditating on God's word and his promises over their lives that when they get out, uh, that, they, that they would be fueled by that rather than subject to all of the noise and the fears that could otherwise ever weigh at their soul. Yeah, great, Michael. And you, right there, you're focusing on the inner core of the leader, you know, the leader is a person. Um, and, and leaders, you've been a leader for such a long time. I'm sure you've had periods of great motivation and mm -hmm. periods where um, motivation's a bit hard. You have to try and find it again. Now, any thoughts, uh, any extra thoughts maybe on how leaders might insulate themselves or protect themselves from a loss of motivation? I have a thought, stop leading. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just give it up. That's, you'll be motivated all the time. No, look, I, I do think it comes with the territory is what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, I think that, in fact, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not even uncertain whether it's very intentional strategy of God. Yeah. I think that um, there are things that push us to the limit. Yeah. Uh, I think there are, as I mentioned, practices that can help you to live in joy and in uh, a sense of fulfilment and a sense of, of connectedness to God. Uh, the Bible calls it, you know, living in the spirit. Uh, it's not an ethereal, unattainable state. It's actually normal Christianity. Uh, but I don't think it happens without uh, engaging in the stillness. Uh, I think the Desert Fathers, you know, that, that, that contemplative kind of prayer, uh, silence, which, you know, I struggle with probably more than most. Um, but it's so en enriching and enthralling to really have that time, to protect that time, to see that as a priority above all else. We are, we're, not, we're not car mechanics. We're not even scientists in a laboratory. We are called to carry the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And inherent in that is that this is a spirit-inspired and led occupation and calling. Without yeah. that, we're reduced to, uh, out of context a bit, uh, Paul's clanging cymbal and gongs, and it's it's empty. Though it, it though at the time one can be so uh, deceived that that I, I'm doing this okay, um, but but it actually is not coming out of the essence of who God created us to be. Um, so I think that again, if I can just uh, seem a little re repetition repetitious and maybe redundant, but um, to get back to basics to ensure that we are approaching every day 
with the spirit of the living God. You know, that beautiful little verse that Paul wrote to the Ephesians, be filled with the spirit. Um, I think it's, you know, in the, in the original language, a present continuous. In other words, be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, and unless we reduce our motivation in a non-transformational way to be exogenous, so to be external. If we're needing external stimulus all the time, whether it's the, the applause of the people for a great sermon pastor, uh, or whether it's the, the gathering of the saints and the thrill of worshipping, uh, then, then I think we are continually, it's almost like a, an unquenchable hunger. Um, but we're, we're, it, when we find that sweet spot uh, of communing daily with our, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, I think then we truly can be approached being the transformational leaders where our motivation is coming from within. Um, my, man, what I'm, what I'm not saying is that's always easy for me and I've always passed that test. Wow, way, way from it. But it's certainly uh, an aspirational goal to stay yeah. in that zone. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Michael. We've just got to protect that, that inner person uh, underneath that exterior leader. Lots and lots of insights here. Thank you very, very much. Um, everyone watching should go and sign up for Leaderscape and, uh, <laughs> and, and access this more. Michael, two last uh, questions or half questions, really. Um, every leader is trying to develop or mentor uh, followers, the next generation after them. So... Uh, perhaps you've got a thought or two about that. And finally, is there any last advice you think we all need to hear as we watch this video? In the main, the raising of the next generation isn't happening. Yeah. Let me qualify. Mm. Um, in, in a lot of the churches that I, I get blessed to be part of, there, there, is, this, there is this almost incubator mm of the next generation. But I will say there is an aging population of church leaders and ministers, it seems to me, around the world. In my decades of working uh, closely with our movement, the ACC in Australia, I think we might have added a decade to the age of the average pastor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I think touching 50. Though there are some real bright lights of churches that are doing exquisitely in, in the endeavour of raising up the next generation. In the main, it's something that is, is absent. And I think that there, there's a real sense of the need for intentionality in that. And I think that you've you got to like the next generation. You've got to understand that this is not an option, that God calls us to, as Paul said to Timothy in his second letter to his young son in the faith, commit these things yeah. to faithful men who are then able to teach, to teach to teach, to teach. Inherent in that, there's a, there's a generational calling um, that is probably more central to our mission than even just ministering to the existing generation. Um, and so I think that there's got to be a, a, a real a biblical understanding that this is part of a central part of our mandate. Um, and then uh, getting very intentional about planning and strategizing that and then having the processes to, to see that uh, actually work. Uh, mm. one, of the, one of the clear systems in church life where that can most beautifully and organically happen is in any small or life group system that is regenerating. We are creating not just uh, a group, but an incubator for raising up the next generation. Um, and I think, uh, I think, you know, it is so, so vital uh, and uh, I think that um, it's something that, that uh, I've seen a uh, huge bright spot and, uh, and huge, a huge dearth uh, yeah. around the world. Yeah, so it sounds like that really is a, a very significant challenge for church leaders right around the world. Yeah, and, and absolutely. And it really is incumbent upon pastors to, and, and again, a, a bit of a pitch here for, for Alpha Crucis um, and, and institution institutions like us that are that are actually the epicenter of who we are is about raising the next generation um, and get a good solid theological standpoint. I think there is a fresh hunger coming back of people really wanting to know uh, the God of the Bible and uh, and really the essence of of, uh, of of the fabric of who I need to become um, as a Christ-like individual and leader. 
Uh, and I think so in the midst of maybe a bit of doom and gloom there, uh, there's mm. a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for those leaders that would stand up and, uh, and, and, and get very intentional about raising up the next generation. Yeah, great. Well, thanks, Michael. It's been really encouraging and very informative to listen to you. We uh, do greatly appreciate your insights. And I pray a God's richest blessing on you, your family, and of course on Leaderscape. Um, go forth and do great things, Michael. Always a pleasure, Steve. Thanks so much for having me. Well, thanks everyone for joining us in this transformative talk. I hope to see you again soon.